Well, we're using this theme of entertaining angels. Entertaining angels. Now, that doesn't mean the angels are entertaining, by the way. Angels don't show up as little cherubs with fluffy wings. If you pay attention what the Bible says about an angel, every time somebody's face to face with one, they're struck down in fear. And so the more appropriate symbol of an angel is not wings, but a sword as leaders of the hosts of heaven by God's ultimate command. So they are the generals and the admirals and the um, leaders of those who fight for God's purposes. And you read that clear through the, um, the scriptures. And so as we celebrate the results of the angel visitation, we want to remember that uh, this is good news, but it's brought with a fierce power. We don't always consider that as a reality of angels, but fierce power is often needed in order to uh, in order to produce the purposes that God has in mind. Well, we are uh, reminded of what we shared last week uh, as we had, um, we had the angel visitation of Zechariah, Gabriel, Gabriel, the angel of uh, first in charge of God's um, army, came first and visited Zechariah. And then Gabriel visited Mary, and Mary, uh, well, young Mary, she says, well, how could this be? Um, which is, I think, an interesting way, but she ended that conversation with, as the Lord desires, I am his servant. And angels visited Joseph to say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Mary's telling the truth about this one. And that was good news. And then uh, as Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, then there was that, uh, um, that jump in her womb of John the Baptist at the presence of the seed of Jesus inside of Mary. Then angels later announced to the shepherd, there's all these things that are going on. So when we talk about entertaining angels, we're not talking about their um, how they make us feel we're talking about what we do when they come when they show up so much of our celebration of the birth of christ is the result of angel visitations and so i want you to think about some of the times when it was likely that you experienced an angel that god sent for you now think about that for just a moment have you experienced god doing something for you that could have only come by a present he sent forth. Now, Bobby nods her head right away. She's experienced walking into an invisible wall that says, do not go in that pool uh, that sent her off to the um, camp nurse after a bee sting. Um, others of you have had protections, and uh, Mary had shared something with me a couple of weeks ago. I've forgotten just exactly the story, but how it was so clear that an angel of God had taken care of her protection and her needs. Now, each of you have probably had encounters with angels you haven't quite figured out or haven't quite uh, cataloged in your mind. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But whatever it is, it is likely that God has surrounded you with his special protection and held you to his purpose through his angels as well as his Holy Spirit. Well, today we're looking at another result of the visit of angels and the Christ that the world so desperately needs. In a world of stress, a world of worry, a world of war, God needs his people to make peace. And that's, uh, those are familiar words when we read through the Gospels, but we're in Isaiah today to find out how the prophet looked forward to making peace and how peace became an important part of everything that the prophet was doing. So here's the most familiar passage in Isaiah that we have about peace. It happens to be when we're talking, thinking about Christmas. For to us a child is born, Isaiah 9, 6, and I'll read into 7 as well. 
For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and the peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Well, that, that uh, enduring vision of the coming of the Christ is there for us to enjoy, even as we recognize the fact Christ has come. We, we are encouraged by the fact that 700 years before his birth, uh, nearly 750 years before the birth of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Isaiah the prophet was given the vision of what would happen as the Messiah, the Christ, came for God's people. And in this, the, pro the prophet promises the Prince of Peace. He promises that his government of peace will continue and will increase from now to forevermore. And I'll tell you what, that's something that we desperately need. I'll back up just uh, in the middle of this slide is this, um, this child that is born that shall be called the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, prince of peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Now, we have kind of just the opposite. We tend to have, um, we have, we tend to have no end to war, no end to strife, no end to struggle. Everybody wants to fight somebody else. Everybody wants to say, mine, 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 when, when instead sharing is what makes things happen. And that selfishness of us interrupts the vision of the peaceable kingdom that Isaiah is sharing with us. He promises this government of peace that's gonna continue from now to forever and this peaceable kingdom that will result is the grand theme of God's restoration of his people that shows up in Isaiah. A, a glorious vision, a perfect world, the restoration of Eden for all mankind, not just for our first parents, Adam and Eve, but for all of us a time when we don't worry about what will be, a time when we don't worry about what we will have, a time when we don't worry about our strength and our health and, and what others might do or what might, uh, what might cause a great fall or collapse, either in finances or in governments or of um, our, our own hopes and dreams. A peaceable kingdom, takes care of all of that. It's wrapped up in the purpose of Christ. We'll see in the 11th chapter of Isaiah, the coming peace through the promised child. And so as we look at a child of promise that Isaiah speaks of, we are directed as we read this, what will happen as the Messiah is brought forth. This is the promise of from where he comes. It's a promise of what happened when, he his, when he's here, and of why he comes. First in Isaiah 11, 1 to 2, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Interesting that the translation here, the ESV uh, translation says, the stump of Jesse. When do you have a stump? usually when the tree is not there anymore. You have a stump when it's had to be removed or it dies. You have a stump when the roots are no longer feeding the tree. But here, the miracle of God begins at that long dead vision. Jesse, the father of King David, uh, brings forth, God brings forth something new. A branch from his roots shall bear so it pops up through the ground. It begins to 
it gets to grow and flower and and bring forth the fruit that it was designed to be. And that fruit is this child that is promised in chapter nine, for unto us a child is born. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, it goes on to say, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It will be a marvelous time when our only fear is the wonder and awe of the presence of God. To be enveloped in that amazing presence of who he is and all that he is in the midst of that spirit, in the midst of his kingdom. You know what? You only enter into that reign if you've already joined the kingdom as a member of Christ. When we accept Christ into our hearts, not only are we forgiven of our sins, not only is there a new reality, but we actually step into the realm of the kingdom of God. It's an already and not yet time. It's an already because it's immediate. Being in the kingdom means we have a king. Being in the kingdom means we pay some attention to the king. Being in the kingdom means that we work toward the king's purposes. Being in the kingdom is an already thing. But being in the kingdom of God is also a not yet, for there's a glorious fulfillment that, that Isaiah is talking about that we will not realize until that time when Christ returns. Well, this is going to be something that will be more than we have ever expected. It comes through this child of promise, and it comes as he, with that spirit of knowledge and counsel and might, will be judging the world, not by force, but by grace. Now, that seems like a strange way to think about it, but as, as I was reading through these scriptures and studying along, I discovered that it is, it is the practice of God to shower us with grace. It is the practice of God to give us undeserved benefit. It is the practice of God to go over and beyond all that we uh, know or expect or think. That is what God does for us. And so this child, as he comes into his own, as his kingdom is established, uh, as he as he fulfills his mission on earth and forever, we have these words. He's judging by grace. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Now, so what's going on here? It is, it is not just what happened but is what God sees beyond what happened. That's why I said judging by grace. Uh, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by just the facts, ma'am. It's not a dragnet case. It's, um, it, it's instead, it let's find out how God can turn this into good, whatever it is. How can God be used to turn this into good. He's judging by grace, but he's also judging by righteousness. Grace does not mean we're free from law. Grace means that law becomes a pattern of our lives by the presence of Jesus in our hearts. And so we discover he's judging by righteousness. Isaiah 11, 4, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. He shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Well, this, oh, let's see, one more line on that. And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Don't expect to stand if you stand on the side of wicked, because the judgment of grace works through the situation and brings forth the possibilities, but that does not remove the guilt of those who are wicked. Instead, it restores the fortunes of those who are poor, 
those who have faced injustice, those who are meek, and by the rod of his mouth, I'll see, we read in Revelation that uh, that's, that's a double-edged sword that comes out that way. He shall strike the earth. So this, you know, back to the angel visitation, the best vision for the angel Gabriel is a mighty man with a sword, not a fluffy thing with wings. And here, what the Christ brings is not just the tenderness of a child, but the brutal reality of a cross. It's why we display a cradle in front of a cross nearly every year. And even if the star is there in our decoration, it is also a star that just points from the cradle to the cross, for it is that brutality of the sacrifice of Christ that brings the grace of the forgiveness of our sins. And that brutality has a judgment that comes. It is the judgment against the wicked. Before he will judge the poor by grace, he shall judge the wicked by righteousness. And we discover that all of this tells us that it is the complete peace that we need that comes by this child, this child of promise that we open this passage with. And here's the armor that the Lord comes wearing in Isaiah 11, verse 5. It says, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. A little child, this complete peace coming from the innocence of faith, uh, the, the glory of God showing up even in the youngest one, even someone like Langston, even someone like Ben or Keon or others who have experienced the reality of God young in their lives. And some of us, Brother Simeon, some of us have experienced that it's carried us through all of the things we faced over these years. Why? Because that child, that Christ child, has shown us his grace through the brutality of the cross and the wonder of the resurrection. This little child leads us forward toward a complete peace that is a not yet thing. And yet it's an already thing in our hearts. And so working that out, working out what's in our hearts, out to the rest of the world, is part of our purpose and part of our mission as we work with Christ for the purposes of God. And reading on, we also discover that we can not just celebrate, um, celebrate that there is a child come, we can celebrate safety because the child has come to us. There's some special things that, that happen. We already began with that as we, as we looked at the fact that uh, the lion shall, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard with the goat, the calf and the lion, the fattened calf together. Uh, so that's a lot of temptation for a lion, by the way. Um, but we can celebrate the complete safety that that vision gives us. No fear, no aggressor, no aggressor. All are given equal position, but that comes by the grace of God, the safety given in the kingdom, the reality of what God wants to do. The cow and the bear shall graze together, okay? Their young shall lie down together. You see, it just continues, this, this peaceable kingdom that is in the vision of Isaiah. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. No more killing, no more blood going on in that case. The nursing child shall pray over the hole of the cobra. You can celebrate the safety of what complete peace really means. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Not even the snakes are a problem anymore. Celebrate the safety that comes in the reality of a peace to come. Now, by the way, don't try that yet. This really isn't about using snakes in worship. This is about a future that is unrealized yet. 
but it shall be part of that peaceable kingdom, that heavenly kingdom, that remade heaven and earth that we get into in the far future whenever God brings it about. We can celebrate peace and we can celebrate security. Now, if you don't have to fear your mortal enemies, if you don't have to fear the hurt and death that comes from those who are aggressive, then not only do you celebrate safety, you celebrate a security. It goes on in Isaiah 11, 9 to say, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, there's, there's the reality that makes the peaceable kingdom come forth. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Now, Isaiah is prophesying this at a time when Jerusalem is about to be under siege, when the northern kingdom, Israel, has already been overtaken and only, uh, only Judea is left. And they, they are um, sometimes getting the story wrong by the king's hire, the earthly king is hiring false prophets to tell him what he wants to hear. And Isaiah is back and forth between giving the bad news of captivity and the good news of God's grace. But he gives us this picture of what Christ shall accomplish in his kingdom. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Well, um, this is something we don't have. The knowledge of the Lord that this is speaking about talks about a relationship. This is intimate knowledge. This is knowing the Lord. This is starting with Jesus in our heart and blossoming up to all of those things that God wants to do in our lives. We can celebrate safety. We will be able to celebrate security in that final kingdom. But in the meantime, we want to celebrate ahead of time the peace that God will bring. And this is a peace that is part of the promise of the Christ, Christ child. It's a peace that's part of the miracles that God works in our lives. It's a peace that's part of the joy that is brought to us because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this 10th verse of Isaiah 11, it says, In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Well, that's the, it, it, in the, the uh, passage that is focusing on this future kingdom, this is, this is the uh, bookend. The root of Jesse began this passage in, in uh, Isaiah 11.1, 1, and the root of Je uh, Jesse ends this piece in uh, chapter 11, verse 10. But it says, of him shall the nations require his resting place shall be glorious. You just look on to what the book of Revelation says about the reign of Christ. And what it says about that is that uh, all will come to him and all will look to Jerusalem. It's because of the presence of Christ there with his, uh, with his final purposes. But in the meantime, we need to remember the peace begins with you and it begins with me. We will not have peace in our world if we don't have peace in our hearts. We will not have peace in our world if the nations cannot figure out that God has the final word, not the one with the biggest guns or the more aggressive spirit. We need to remember the peace begins with you. The, the word from Isaiah in verse 3 of chapter 26 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. See, it begins with Jesus in our heart, the peace of Christ, freeing us from fear of God, little fear of our, the punishment of our sin, because we know it's been forgiven, and we can focus instead on the Holy One of Israel, the God of the universe, the one who has made us and proves us and plans for us. This is the God that we celebrate. And when we focus on God, 
in the midst of war, in the midst of worry, in the midst of wonder, in the midst of strife, we can live in peace in our souls. Peace, perfect peace in this world of sin. Love of Jesus gives us peace within. Look that up in the red hymnal. The song is titled Perfect Peace. There's four verses that I didn't copy down that uh, just read through them as how God works peace in our hearts and out through our lives. It's based in this perfect peace that, when, that happens when we focus on Christ. It begins with you because it begins in you. And then we also discover that righteousness and peace are a package. They're not separate things. They go together. They go together completely. Um, in Isaiah chapter 32, 17, it says the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. You want to know how to finally get into this peace? Well, get Jesus in your heart. Know that you're forgiven by his sacrifice on the cross. Know that he is establishing his kingdom of peace within your heart. And know that you can stay in peace even when the world is subject to terror around you. And know that if you stick with God, that you will experience a peace that will result in quietness and trust forever. See, if you never let go of God, if you never let go of God, if you never let go of what God wants to do in your heart and in your life, Righteousness and peace come as a package. The Holy Spirit leads you to righteousness, and the peace of God is fulfilled within your actions and all. But, you know, there's a backside to this. If righteousness or peace are a thing together, it means when we rebel against the laws of God, our peace is lost. And Isaiah says that, too. It's, it's, it's the lament of chapter 48, verse 18, Oh, that God says, oh, that you would have paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Only if, only if, only if. It's a huge word in the Bible, if you pay attention. Oh, that you had. That's a long way to say, only if you had paid attention to my commandments. And so that means in this world, individually, we need to find peace within, and we need to hang on to it, stick with it, and follow through with that. And we also need the bringers of peace to be active in our world. It is Isaiah who says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. We need the bringers of peace. We need those who proclaim the good news, who speak about God's goodness all the time, who publish peace. That means in what you say, in what you do, in your actions and your behaviors and your words to lead those who are lost back to the one who's, who they are looking for, who's always been looking for them, always been ready for them to return. Always the focus of God's attention. For remember the story of the Good Shepherd that Jesus gives the shepherd leaves those who are safe to go find the one who is lost. That's the heart of God. He doesn't need those who are already huddled together in righteousness to have the overarching protection, but the shepherd needs to find those who are yet lost. And we need to bring that good news. For God reigns. There is judgment for sin, but there is grace that comes in Christ. And in fact, our only hope is in Christ. Always and forever, 
people might proclaim peace, a few work to make peace, but for the real peace, we need that Christ that is promised, that Christ that has come, that Christ that is taught, that Christ that has showed us what it's like to live a life for God, that Christ that finally gives himself up for our good. Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. In other words, he was killed for our sin, so we didn't have to die a spiritual death. He was crushed for our iniquities. It was the brutality of the judgment of our sin that caused his death on the cross, because upon him was the chastisement. Oh, that's the punishment. That's the ropes. That's the stripes. That's the whip that tears the flesh open. It is that terror that he endured that brings peace for us. And with his wounds, we are healed. Only through Christ is our hope. Not just the words of Isaiah of what will come, but working, allowing the reality of Christ to make that a reality in our lives. That is our hope. That is our purpose. That is the, that is the promise of peace that we can celebrate and we can, um, we can proclaim today. Let us pray together. Thank you, Father, that your purpose is peace. In this world that is so desperately in need of peace, individuals that this moment are suffering, the wicked that this moment are hurting others or plotting to do so or plotting their acts of selfishness. Lord, we need the peace of Christ. Help us as members of your kingdom to be bringers of peace, proclaimers of good news. Be those who publish the peace and who publish the how-to of be healed through Christ, know that forgiveness comes through the cross. Know that God will work his purposes through his people that are saved, that are healed, healing of the soul and the life and the heart. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.